Well, a huge thank you to you for joining me today to chat. I'm thrilled and honoured to be joined by you as the highest ever Premier League goal scorer. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me on and um, I hope everything goes well for you. So, yeah, I look forward to it. And I'm, like I said, I'm very grateful for you coming on. First of all, today, I'd like to go back and ask you about how your love for football first started. As It takes a tremendous amount of talent to make it professional without even thinking about the level you got to. So how did your love for the game first start as a child? Well, as soon as I could walk, really. Um, you know, being from the uh, being from the northeast, my dad sort of chucked a, a football at my feet as soon as I could walk, and that was it. I was out in the garden, um, and that's where I got my love from for football. Um, and ever since then, it was um, straight after school, in the garden, playing during school time and the break times. It was... It was uh, playing football, and um, <clears throat> I was I was half decent at it. And uh, I got into my school team, and then my city team, and county, etc. Newcastle boys, um, and then lucky enough got uh, got asked for a trial down to uh, down to Southampton by a, a great man, great scout who was no longer with us, a guy called Jack Hickson, um, and uh, that was it. I went down on trial and. Um, I got asked to sign schoolboy forms and that was it. And you clearly had a passion for it by what you've just said there. But I spoke with a few people about this, whatever they do, whether they're a musician or footballer. Is when we are young, we all have our, have our ambitions to get to the highest we possibly can. But with football, did you ever have other ambitions in case you didn't make it? Or was it a case right from the start that you did wanted to did want to be a footballer? Um yeah, I shouldn't really say this to uh, to a youngster who's about to leave school, <laughs> but but I didn't. Uh, it was um, all my eggs were in one basket. It was football, or I didn't know what yeah. I was uh, or what I was going to do. Thankfully, um, I got lucky. I worked hard, and I think that's key to whatever you do in life. I think everyone's everyone's given an opportunity at a at a um, at a young age, and it's how you take that opportunity. I was lucky enough; I was given one in football because I was half decent at it but I certainly wasn't one of the best so, uh, well definitely not one of the best at 15 when I left home to, to leave Newcastle to go down to Southampton so <clears throat> I think what I did do was work harder than anyone else and um, there's a good old saying the harder you work the more lucky you get and I think that's the case Did you enjoy watching Newcastle every week as well as well as playing? Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I was a big Newcastle fan. My dad was a Newcastle fan. I used to go and stand on the um, on the terraces, the Gallagher end, as a as a kid. Kevin Keegan was uh, was my hero when he played for uh, for Newcastle in 1982. Back then, many years ago, when I had a bit more hair. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was uh, that was it. It was football. It was watching Newcastle, and it was more football. That's two people now that have said Keegan's the hero on this. Razor said it as well. You said he even used to have a Keegan perm. <laughs> well, I never had a Keegan perm. I could never grow my hair that long. Um, but it's, he was uh, he was like the Pied Piper. Wherever he went in Newcastle, everyone sort of followed and all the young kids followed and I was no different. I went to the training ground. I went to the, uh, the ground. I went to watch all the games and um, I just loved, well, I loved Newcastle United. I loved his style of play. And yeah, as we've just pretty much covered there, he was a great player. As you said a couple of minutes ago that you moved to Southampton um, not long after you left school, how did you find it moving there with being a Newcastle lad? It was probably the furthest south you could get to start your career. How did you find it when you moved down there? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, it was, um, it was exciting, but it was also difficult because I wasn't just moving around the corner. I was moving 330 miles down the motorway. Um, and you're right, it couldn't have... I couldn't have chosen a further further away, um, but it was scary. But it was also looking back on it when I got to start my professional career, it was probably the best thing I did because I had to grow up, I had to learn how to live, um, I had to go out and buy myself things rather than my, my mum and dad doing it for me. Um, so it was hard because I couldn't just when I was missing home I couldn't just um, pop home because it was it took that long to uh, to get home. Um, but it was it was tough. But it was the best thing I did because of all of those things that I said. It, it and it it helped me grow up a lot. 
And I imagine you never knew anyone when you went down there either. And I bet that sort of helped in a way because in football, you are going to get transfers where you go to teams and you don't really know the players there and everything. So I bet that sort of helped in a way too. Well, there was a couple of lads that, <coughs> excuse me, that went down from the northeast. Um, and I was in Diggs, uh, which was just around the corner from the Dell, which was the ground, Southampton's ground there. Um, and then one of the northeast, the other northeast lads, Neil Madison, he moved into my digs as well, which sort of helped us. And we um, we sort of stuck in together, myself and, and him. Um, but yeah, it was hard for him and it was hard for me. Um, but it was it was a brilliant experience. I mean, the years I had at Southampton were just magnificent. We had a great team spirit. We had some very good players in there. Um, uh, Matt Letizia was in there. Uh, you may not have heard, but the three Wallace boys, Rod, Danny and Ray. Uh, we had Jimmy Case, who was one of the greatest midfielders of all time, he used to play for Liverpool. Um, so, And we had uh, Razor Ruddock in there, which um, he entertained us all. <laughs> yeah, I bet he did. It, when you first started breaking it in the first team at Southampton, did these all help you fit in well? And yeah, it was, it was a great experience. I mean, I'd, I'd made my debut at 17. Um, my debut was a was a uh, against Chelsea away, and then my full debut was yeah. against uh, was against Arsenal when I managed to start the game at seventeen, and because of the, the long journey down, uh, and I didn't I didn't find out I was playing until about half eleven that morning. So my mum and dad couldn't come down because they didn't have time. Um, so it was and I didn't have it was a good thing really because I didn't have time to get nervous. So I was told I was playing at half eleven, and of course then we kicked off at. Uh, at three o'clock, and then that was it. I made my full debut and managed to score a hat trick um, on my uh, on my debut. And I, I think the record still stands. If I'm you correct me if I'm wrong, maybe. But I broke Jimmy Greaves' record and, and become the youngest player to score a top flight hat trick. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, I think that still stands. And um, when you got that hat trick as well, you'll have had loads of news about you in the tabloids. At that young age at eighteen, were you used to that at that point, or you still seventeen? <clears throat> um, no, it was great. I enjoyed it. I mean, that's 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 ultimately what I wanted. That's why I left home was to to be a professional footballer and then uh, then to become a professional and, and obviously make my debut, etc. Um, I just I loved the uh, I loved the headlines, but Southampton being the way they were and the manager being the way the way he was, Chris Nichol was the manager. He got me in the next day to clean up the kit, clean up the dressing rooms, just to bring me back down. To earth because I was still an apprentice. It wasn't. I didn't sign professional forms until maybe a week or two after that. So I was still an apprentice when I made my debut. And you broke into the Southampton team, became a regular, which is <coughs> where you indeed made your name. But then in July 1992, you moved to Blackburn Rovers for at the time, if I'm right, was a British record fee of 3.6 million. But you you were fantastic there. But what does stick out at your career at Blackburn is the title winning season in 94-95. Could you talk me through the mentality that season? Did you expect to go on and win the title and beat Man United or was it like the belief grew over the course of the season? No, we expected to beat them. We perhaps could have and should have beat them, beaten them the year before because we ran them really close. But bearing in mind Blackburn... Um, were in the in the second division um, three years before that. Um, so when I signed in '92 was the first year of the Premier League. I think we finished maybe for sixth. I think something like that in our first season. Then runners up in our second season, um, and then to win it, to win the Premier League, to take on the might of Man United and Liverpool and Arsenal and all these huge football clubs and. Little old Blackburn. I know they were financed by um, by Jack Walker, uh, but it's still an unbelievable achievement for Blackburn to come into the big boys' league and take on them all and beat them all and win the Premier League. Um, we sort of fell over the line in the end in, in 94, 95 because we went, had to go to Anfield and Liverpool beat us on that final day of the season. But because West Ham, uh, our Man United weren't able to beat West Ham at Upton Park, that meant we won the title and it was... Um, it was everything that we hoped for. It was everything that I was told was going to happen when I went for talks with Blackburn three years earlier. So for us to come in and do that, yeah, it was um, it was a great achievement. And Kenny Dalglish was a great manager. 
we we perhaps might not have been technically the best football side, but what we were the best at is having the best attitude and we had a great team spirit and that's what got us over the line in the end. And it must have been an amazing feeling winning the Premier League title and beating all of these teams. And some people class it as sort of like the closest thing that's happened to Leicester winning it in 2015, mm. 2016. Yeah, the only I think the only difference there is is that um, we were expected to challenge yeah. because of what ha- what happened the year finishing before. Second. We finishing second, so they knew we were coming. They, they knew that we were um, going to be very difficult to stop. Whereas Leicester, I mean, no one saw that coming at all. No one could have predicted that. Mm. And I think what happened with Leicester is, is every other club was in a transitional period that season. And Leicester got on a roll and um, it was like a snowball effect and there was no one stopping Leicester that season. And everyone, including myself, was saying, this can't, it can't, it has to stop. This can't happen. But to their credit, they just went on and on and on. And then, as I said, eventually no one could stop them. And um, what an incredible story it was. And that's what's good or great about our Premier League is there are stories like Blackburn and, and like Leicester. It's good to see um, teams that do come and br- break the top teams and yeah. go on and win the title, or even if it's just finishing in the top four. It's brilliant to see. No, it is. It gives every. I mean, I, I, more often than not, you're going to get the big boys winning the Premier League because they've got more finance than uh, than anyone else. Um, but I think that's what's special about our league is on any given day that um, we could have a Leicester. <laughs> You could have what West Ham are doing this season. Leicester are doing it again this season into the into the uh, into the top four, and of course with our story, what happened in uh, in, in Blackburn in ninety four ninety five. And I guess that's what just makes the Premier League the best league in the world. Well, we've got. Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's the most entertaining. It's the most watched. We've got some unbelievable players and had some amazing players over the years and. We've now got some of the best managers in the uh, in the world in in our league, and when you and the look at the stadiums, the pitches, the standard of football, then that's why the Premier League is the best in the world. <clears throat> and um, you had another Premier League season at Blackburn, but then you went to a major tournament with England, Euro '96, where you finished the top scorer. But did you take away? the achievement massively on a personal level, despite the nation falling so short in the semi-finals? Well, our main object was to go and win it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> we went so close and, and that would have been that, that would have been number one priority. Um, but me as a centre forward, it was my job to score goals. I know I went to the tournament on the back of a barren run, really, for England. Um, so for me to finish top scorer, then... Um, that was some way of making up for not winning the uh, not winning the tournament. Um, and yeah, I mean, personal satisfaction, yeah, um, to see my name up there with the top scorers in European Championships. Then um, they can't ever, no one can ever take that away from me. But um, if you if you offer me top scorer or to win the European Championships, then I take winning the European Championships all day. But looking on a personal level, as you said, be, being a striker and beating the likes of Zola, Jürgen Klinsmann to the top scorer. It's a really good achievement. Yeah, it is. I remember, um, obviously, we got knocked out in the semi-finals. Um, and then Jürgen Klinsmann, Klinsmann was on three goals, I think he was. And he got to the final with Germany and we couldn't play. So I'm, I remember sat watching the final thinking, I'm hoping that Jürgen doesn't yeah. score two or, <laughs> two or three goals here to equal or to beat me to the uh, to the golden boot. So. Thankfully, he didn't. And I think you're just thinking England haven't won it, so I just thought I could get something out of this. Yeah, well, that's it. We had it's just if we uh, if it's uh, penalties again and Gareth Southgate, unfortunately, but there's no blame attached to Gareth. He was um, he was brave enough to step up and and take one. And, and just unfortunate that there. it was saved and it was not meant to be for England again, unfortunately. As um, you proved yourself in the tournament by, as we've just said, top scorer and a Blackburn scoring plenty of goals. One of the biggest points in your career after that tournament was in July, 
moving to Newcastle for a record breaking 15 million. I'm sorry to ask you this, as I know you might have been asked this loads, but could you tell me the deciding factors that made you choose your boyhood club over the likes of Manchester United, Real Madrid that was sniffing around? Yeah, um, it was always my dream to play for my club. And we spoke earlier about me standing on the terraces. So I wanted to wear the number nine shirt and I wanted to, I wanted to score goals at the Gallagher end. Um, and I wanted to play football for Newcastle. Um, and it wasn't as if I was going to a football club that weren't challenging. The season before I signed, um, uh, Newcastle had just blown that 12-point lead that they had at the top of, uh, ahead of Man United, and Man United clawed them back. Um, so it wasn't as, as if I was going to a club that were in the bottom half of the league. Um, and uh, it, was a, it was a tough decision, because I know I would have won a stack more trophies going to to Manchester United um, but when you look what I've got there now I've had an unbelievable 10 years there I had my testimonial I've got my foundation which we set up because of the testimonial um, I've got a statue uh, I broke my dad's hero's record scoring record Jackie Milburn um, so it was a great decision and if I had the same decision to make now I, I would do exactly the same thing and I've got no regrets at all and I, don't, I can understand that because Newcastle are a great club and it's like you said, it's not like you're going to a bottom half and they'd finished second. And the fact that you went to all the games as a young kid and watched Kevin Keegan as your hero and the thought as well uh, that your family would be watching you week in, week out, that must have been a brilliant feeling. Well, it was, as I said, it was always my dream to, <coughs> to play for Newcastle. And, <coughs> excuse me. And wear that shirt. Um, and I did it, and it was everything I hoped it would be, and uh, and a lot more. So it was a great decision. Your career went very far at Newcastle, scoring plenty of goals. And two of my personal favourites is um, the free kick against Wimbledon in 1996. Couldn't get any more top corner. And I'm sure one of your more famous ones is the volley against Everton in 2002. Looking back at all of your career at Newcastle, do you have a personal fondest memory, like a favourite goal or even your testimonial or anything like that? Because I'm sure that must have been a very special moment for you. I mean, it's, it's impossible for me to uh, to pick one out um, because I had so many special moments. And um, I mean, the first one, you just mentioned it against Wimbledon, my, the free kick, that was the dream come true. I'd scored at St James's Park while in a, in a Newcastle shirt with a number nine on. So that was an incredible feeling. Um, the, t the two semi-finals we had at, uh, at Old Trafford were incredible moments. Scoring two uh, in the San Siro against Inter Milan in the Champions League was incredible. Uh, the volley, as you've just said, was probably my best goal that I, uh, that I ever scored, in my opinion. I know people have their opinions on which one is the best, but in my opinion, the volley against Everton was the best. But I think if you push me for one, um, the testimonial you said was, wow, what, what a night that was. Um, but if you push me for one, one moment, um, it would have to be that afternoon when I broke Jackie Milburn's record. Um, yeah. That had stood for so many years. Uh, and that, uh, that goal, when it went in at the Gallagher end, um, that, that feeling that I had, it was um, hairs on the back of the neck stand up for... 15 or 20 minutes, it was just a, a sensational feeling and the noise that was reverberating around the, uh, around the ground was, uh, was just magnificent and for that moment alone it was worth me signing for Newcastle back in 1996. Was that when you broke the all-time Premier League goal-scoring record? No, that was when I broke yeah. Jackie Milburn's yeah. uh, re record, uh, New the Newcastle record that had been and Jackie Milburn was my dad's hero, so um, so to do that was uh, was yeah. unbelievably special. Yeah. Um, can you recall the moment when you broke the all-time Premier League record? When you got that goal, that got you the all-time record. Well, I think I don't know. You would have to. Tell, I think I've had the goal-scoring record um, since about nineteen ninety-four. I think it was because. <sighs> I went to Blackburn uh, from Southampton, as we've spoken about, and and uh, I got injured on the Boxing Day, uh, and I already had 16 Premier League goals, so I didn't then play for, um, for six or seven months after that. Uh, 
But then the, that year after that, I scored 30 odd goals. And I think from, yeah, from around about 1994, I've had the, uh, I've, I've had the most goals in the, uh, in the Premier League. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a nice feeling seeing my name at the top of that goal scoring mm. list. And no one's, I don't think anyone's in close competition <clears throat> either at the minute. No disrespect to anyone else, but <laughs> do you ever just have a moment where you just think that it's amazing that your name is at the top of that list of goal scorers? Yes, um, I mean, that's what I, I set out to do when I was a kid, um, was to score as many goals as I can and to work hard and all those training sessions that I had on my own, putting the ball on the back of the net and repetitive afternoons of, of just doing that made it all worthwhile. So, um, as I said earlier, my very first, one of my very first comments to you was um, I wasn't the best when at, at 15, but I think I worked harder than anyone else, um, and that's what um, that's what's helped me get to the top of the uh, top of the goal scoring chart. And this clearly, obviously, paid off for you. Yeah, as it's, uh, it has, without uh, without a doubt, um, you don't get anywhere without hard work. And I want to touch upon this question now, while we've been talking about the record for highest goal scorer and everything. You and Thierry Henry rightly saw the other month, last month, April, were inducted into the Premier League Hall of Fame. How did it feel to get inducted into that as the first, as one of the first two inductees? Out of the yeah, it was amazing. Players? It's amazing because you look at the list of the players that we've had in the Premier League I and mean, some of the great, great players. So, for myself and Thierry to uh, to be announced as the, as the first two was a very special feeling. Um, yeah, it's it, it made all the hard work worthwhile, and uh, it was it's amazing because as I said, I mean, look at Gerard and Keane and Vieira and Cantona and Bergkamp and all these uh, Ryan Giggs, all these incredible players that have, that have played for so long and won so much. So. To see me and Thierry in their first in was, uh, was, was an amazing feeling. And because you're the highest <laughs> goal scorer, it was probably right that you got inducted and Thierry Henry as well because my dad's an Arsenal fan and he can't speak highly enough of <laughs> <him. laughs> so Yeah, that, Thierry was a great player. He was an unbelievable player, yeah. So you two were probably the right first two to have inducted, but when I had a look at that list of the rest of them and you can only have another six in there, it's so hard to possibly pick six of them. There's just so many talented players, which goes back to what we said earlier about Premier League being the best league in the world, the players that have played in it and just everything. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. When you look at the list that we've had in, uh, in, in our Premier League since it started, way back in 1992 um, to where we are now, um, we've had some amazing players and um, that's why it's the best league. And you have played with some great players, such as not just at Newcastle because you had David Ginola there, but in the England national team, you had Gaza formed a really good partnership with Teddy Sheringham, which is mm. famous for England. And do you have one that you just found amazing to play with? Well, I've been lucky over the years. I've had some great partnerships. Um, I've always found the best partnerships. Uh, are the ones that you don't have to work at. I mean, I mm. had um, I went to Blackburn. And I had uh, Chris Sutton, um, who was brilliant. I had Mike Neal, who was also great. Um, and then I went to Newcastle and I had one season with Les Ferdinand and we, on, we scored 49 goals between us, I think it was. Um, Craig Bellamy was great for me at Newcastle towards the end of uh, end of my career. And you just mentioned Teddy Sheringham there with uh, with England. Wow, he was um, it was he was great. But it just sort of clicked with all of them. It didn't really have to work. Uh, we have to work at it on a training ground, um, and those are often are the are the, are the, are the best partnerships. As a striker, too, I imagine you you have played against some brilliant defenders. <clears throat> Do you have one that you could pick and say you just never wanted to play against? Because they were so good. I wouldn't say I'd never wanted to play against, but, but I'll say yeah. uh, who was the hardest and who was probably the best player defender I played against. He was Tony Adams at uh, yeah. at Arsenal. I mean, he, he played in 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 such a great back four. He had Lee Dixon on the right. He had Nigel Winterburn on the left. He had Steve Bald or Martin Keown alongside him as uh, as centre half, and then an unbelievable goalkeeper behind them and David Seaman. And 
And those were the days where you could have one free tackle before you got a yellow card. So we always were looking yeah. behind us, waiting for that tackle to come. And um, we had some great battles over the years. But Tony was a was a great captain for Arsenal and brilliant for yeah. uh, for England also. And he was uh, he was as tough as they come. He was one of the greatest defenders to play for Arsenal. Looking at a whole team, would you say the Arsenal team and the Man United team, late 90s, early 2000s, would you say one of them is the hardest teams you've played against? Yeah, well, we went up against um, Arsenal in 98 in the FA Cup final when they won the double that year. Um, they won the FA Cup and the league. And then we played Man United the year later in the FA Cup final when they were winning, where they went on to win the treble, the FA Cup, the Champions League, and of course the uh, the league. So um, yeah, those two sides that were there were outstanding. And of course, you had the Arsenal team, also the the uh, Invincibles, who were unbeaten in the Premier League season. So that whether that'll ever be done again remains to uh, remains to be seen. So. There've been some great teams over the years, but yeah, probably that Arsenal and, uh, and those Man United sides that we played in the cup finals were superb. Yeah, there have been some brilliant teams over the years. I'd like to talk about something now a bit current because um, next, um, I imagine you'll be working on it. Next month we have the Euros. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts for England going into this? Yeah, I mean, we've got some... We've got some um, some incredibly talented players, particularly in um, in forward positions. I mean, you look at Ford and, and Mason Mount and Harry Kane. We've got Jack Grealish, and Jaden Sancho, Raheem Sterling, um, Marcus Rashford, Mason Greenwood. I mean, the, 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 the list that we've got is incredible. And he's got great options, Gareth Southgate. So maybe I think for the first time under Gareth that we go into a tournament with expectations to do well um, and uh, we could play a lot of our games in England at Wembley uh, so who knows um, I'm, I'm hopeful I know we got to a semi-final in uh, Russia in the World Cup um, was it three years ago now so uh, but that was sort of unexpected no one really thought we'd get that far no we had some, a, a decent run to get there but um, with this team um, then, yeah, I think we can do well in the tournament, yeah. Like you said as well, we're absolutely spoilt for choice because you've got all them players and if you look at it, we're all in the same position. So Gareth's absolutely got loads of players that he can choose from. It must be, <coughs> it's got to be a rock-hard decision for him, picking a 26-man squad and having to leave some great players out. Yeah, it's... Um... I mean, it might help him that he's now got another three names. He can he can name twenty uh, twenty six man squad instead of twenty three. Um, but having said that, he's still he's still going to have to leave some very talented players out. I mean, we mentioned the forward positions. Look at the right backs that we uh, that we have. I mean, it's it's incredible. I've never I can't I've never known it in in my time that we've ever had such a pool of talent for right back positions. I mean, Trent Alexander Arnold, Rhys James. Kyle Walker, Kieran Trippier, Wan Bissaka, um, Tarek Lamptey's injured. Um, Bakaya Saka can play anywhere. Yeah. Um, so I mean that that's an unbelievable list of, of players. So there's there's a lot of that the players on that list are going to have to be left out also. So yeah, we've got some excellent players, and um, let's hope it goes well for us. Yeah, and um, that's that. Then, and I want to thank you so much, Alan, for coming on today it's been a pleasure to talk to you thank you thanks for your time and uh, good luck with what you decide to do in the future and work hard stick in there thank you and thank you again all the best thank you cheers Blake